Welcome to session three of our Parkinson's Primer series, Why Communication Becomes Difficult in Parkinson's. We're delighted for Josefa Domingos and John Dean to join us again. Josefa Domingos is a physiotherapist and she's worked exclusively with the Parkinson's population since 2004. And John is a speech and language pathologist who has worked with the Parkinson's population since 2007. Thank you both for joining us and thank you to everyone that's participating today. We'll hand it over to you two. Well, in Portugal. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for- uh, Welcome. Again. Yes. Been looking forward to this all week. Um, I, I'm gonna pull up the slides, but again, if anyone has any questions or any thoughts, uh, don't hesitate to give us a, a cue. We can kind of answer anything we, we have been around in this space for a bit. So um, I'm gonna start with the slides. Move it out of the way here. So again, uh, as Casey alluded, we are going to be talking about why communication becomes difficult in Parkinson's. And as we get in here, we got two primary parts for our agenda. We're gonna begin by talking about how Parkinson's, the disease itself affects communication. And then we're gonna get into tips and strategies for addressing that in different kinds of environments, whether that's workplace, in the home, out in the community. So um, one thing I like to do at the very outset is, is mention that when we talk about communication in Parkinson's, it covers an awful lot of ground. Um, on the one hand, you have the big area of, of the language, the big blue area over here, and that includes a lot of cognitive components like attention, particularly focused attention, or uh, uh, maybe alternating if you're going back from one communication partner to another, memory. Um, obviously, many people talk about word finding and then all the other kind of motor factors, movement related factors of, of that. And then a, a big part of what I think you more frequently encounter are issues related to speech production. And at the top of that list is voice, but also the lips, the teeth, and the tongue, and what we call the articulators. And then breath and, and voice control go hand in hand. And so we'll talk about a lot of that. We're going to focus a little bit more on the voice side, the speech side of things, but we will cover all this. But it's just a very large ball of wax, and we want to make sure we don't skip anything. So first thing I would like to talk about is just how common this issue is. And, and it's one of these things where it shows up so often. Of course, I'm a speech therapist, so I'm a little biased, but it shows so often that I feel like it's almost a hallmark. And the most common research article you hear cited all the time is 89% of people with Parkinson's are going to experience some kind of communication difficulty at some point. That's not necessarily early on. That can often appear later on, but that's, that's about what tracks with my practice. What might be more interesting is to note that uh, near the beginning of diagnosis, a couple of years in, 40% uh, of people with Parkinson's are actually reporting an issue themselves. So it's a self-reported data. They're identifying it as an issue, or maybe they have a care partner that's able to identify it, and it helps with, with awareness. This is from a nice large cohort of about 500 people that they've been following for a long time in England and the UK. And then uh, if you take that to the next step, then there's actually researchers who are identifying speech deficits in early uh, Parkinson's people who aren't taking medications. And at that point, they're finding actually nearly double that amount. So almost 80% of people having some kind of identifiable speech issue. Um, it's very common. And then uh, this study on the end, number four down the bottom, they actually found indications of changes in the voice five years before diagnosis. And this is kind of an interesting study because they had a, a famous newscaster in Canada and they were able to go back over the video prior to the disclosure of the diagnosis and see differences in his speech that they could identify. That's actually becoming pretty common now. And there are a number of uh, tech companies, startup companies that are using the voice as kind of a biometric. We were just watching uh, the Michael J. Fox uh, documentary still that just came out last week or two weeks ago, and we're we're listening for it too. So you could probably do the same thing with with an actor like that. Takeaway here is that speech issues, communication issues, are fairly common in Parkinson's, and, and why that is, I think it's important to realize that there are a lot of physical components of Parkinson's. So we always talk about the rigidity, the muscle stiffness that's usually happening in a joint. Um, the slowness of movement, um, and then sometimes tremor, although it's not always present in Parkinson's, 
those are external factors that you can observe. That's something your doctor is doing when they have you doing that unified Parkinson's disease rating scale test. Well, whatever you can see externally is going to be happening internally, and that's going to affect all the structures involved in communication. So if you have some muscle stiffness externally, you can assume that you also have that affecting the larynx, the voice box, uh, the tongue, uh, and then same thing with the speed of the movement. If that's also affecting the tongue or other parts of the articulation, it's going to influence the way communication happens because maybe you're trying to make a T sound and your tongue's supposed to go up against the back of your front teeth and the alveolar ridge, and it might not get all the way there. It might not get there as quickly enough. And so that's kind of the, the analog. Whatever's happening externally is also happening internally, and that's where this kind of fits in together. And then, then all the other parts, of this, I won't go through this whole graphic, but the breast support and some of the postural stuff and the other things like that. I would say most commonly though, uh, in Parkinson's, it's voice that is affected and particularly quiet speech, which you might see like a doctor calling hypophonia. And that just simply means quiet speech or small speech. And that to me is so common in Parkinson's that I consider it a hallmark. Meaning that uh, if you come into my clinic and I'm doing an assessment, and you don't present with that, I want to know more. You know, maybe you are a professional voice user, maybe you're a teacher, and you've had a lot of development of your voice over time, or you know how to turn it on. Okay, well, then that explains it. But if that doesn't explain it, then I start to look and make sure that this is really uh, the right diagnosis for me. Um, once you get beyond voice, then those other factors we're talking about with the rigidity and the slowness of movement start to affect pitch and word stress, and the way you're producing those consonants and vowel sounds. And um, if you think about it, we use pitch quite a bit. You know, if I'm asking you a question, I'm going to go up at the end of it. And like, I'm just asking you a question. You know, Did you see that? All of a sudden, you know that I, I've asked you a question and I'm expecting a response. In the same way, if there's something where I'm trying to correct a problem, no, no, I'm, I'm talking about the dog. I'm talking about the book. And by using that stress, I'm, I'm telling you, hey, that's the part we're not understanding. And if you don't have as much movement, rigidity, it's not moving as quickly, then maybe those uh, indicators aren't there as well and you lose some of that, that clarity. So it's not always just about the quality of the voice or the, the volume of the voice. And then um, the harshness of the voice is interesting because the voice happens because we have these two flaps of skin down there in the vocal folds, you're pushing air through and they vibrate. But if one side is not moving completely freely, it's going to make that happen in a way that is imprecise and you'll get air coming out in rushes of air and it's going to make it a kind of a rough vocal quality. And uh, that that's also going to play into when you have that rough vocal quality and you have the air in the system and maybe the white noise that comes with that, it makes it harder to hear. It makes it more shh sound while you're trying to communicate and these all come into play. Oops, I beg your pardon, I mean, that. Um, there are some other physical con uh, contexts where I think it has a huge influence on communication. And I've, I've learned that over the years with working so closely with a physio. Um, so if your posture is leaning forward and that leaning forward or uh, posture, the kyphosis as we call that, is pretty common in Parkinson's. Now your eye contact has changed. Maybe you're not looking directly at the person and you're now aiming your speech signal towards their sternum or towards their stomach rather than towards their ears. And that's important because we need eye contact to make exchanges. I need to say, I understand you, or hey, I have something else I want to add. And they're actually looking at your mouth while you're talking. So if you're obscuring that in some way, that's going to have an influence on communication. And when you lean forward, it also influences your breath support, the amount of air you're going to get into your lungs. And it might also influence the, the gravity itself might influence the way the lips and teeth and the tongue all work together. So these all come into play. And, and influence communication well beyond just whether or not your vocal folds are coming together and, and getting enough sound. Yeah, we'd see that because of uh, Parkinson is a complex disease. It has motor and non-motor uh, symptoms that will be influencing, that will be influencing uh, all the symptoms, right? So it, uh, communication will be obviously one of the activities that will also be influenced by things that you would uh, obviously connect like uh, cognition, if I'm having more difficulty finding the words, which is a very common one to, to express. 
or even attention or being able to uh, hear uh, well. So these all that influence of the communication if I'm getting the right information. If we think about it, anxiety, if I'm more anxious, I'm probably having more difficulty even uh, hearing the other person. So to be able to communicate, we have to be have a certain capacity of hearing and also talking, right? So sometimes we focus a lot on the talking, but the hearing is also important. Um, I would say sometimes I see people are uh, afraid they're going to forget what they're going to say. And so they say it quickly from, from my practice. I see, or they might come in, in and even if I'm talking with somebody else, they might come in and they interrupt the conversation quickly because they're just afraid of forgetting what they were going to say. So you can see the anxiety mixed with the incapacity to retain the information, um, obviously with, with fear also coming in. If we think, okay, so this wasn't enough, then we have obviously relation between depression. If the person is feeling more depressed, obviously our, uh, our initiation of, or wanting to talk is already compromised. So somebody's talking to us and yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you won't make that much effort to, you know, uh, this, I wouldn't say this is on purpose. This is just the reflection of these symptoms and how they influence communication. I'd say one of the, the, the toughest one would definitely be apathy. And apathy means I am indifferent for anything that's happening around me. It's just, it's defined as I don't care, right? Um, and that is particularly difficult on, on family as well. But it's not that the person is depressed. It's just there's a lack of initiative to even talk. So I would say I'm going to highlight two in particular, which is the fatigue and the sleepiness as well. Fatigue being a complex symptom that, that it's not just about feeling tired, but um, and sleepiness as well, not being restful enough and how we already have research showing how that also influences cognition and that influences obviously communication, right? So let me give you two examples where we highlight this. The perception we have working with people, we realize that uh, people start telling me things like, I have to put on my glasses so that I can hear you better, which is hilarious one, which means I need more information to be able to hear better. And also, as you can see here, it's like, I think that um, I think better when I'm sitting down. And this would usually come from someone that is actually having challenges with balance. So I started testing this with some people. It's like, uh, if, if I'm having, if I want to ask somebody a question and I know the person is, has as one of the main issues balance, I will probably try to have that conversation in the sitting position. This is the learning point as a professional and obviously that we transmit to the person with Parkinson and family to understand that sometimes uh, you're walking out and you see a friend and you're gonna stand in the, you're gonna be in the standing position talking to them for a while. And you think about the standing still requires a lot of effort and brings on fatigue. So after a while, your postures change, your balance is becoming compromised you are having difficult to think, you are having difficult to communicate. So that is a snowball that could be reduced. How, what do you think? If I'm in a, if I'm in a public place, I can probably like uh, just touch something. As long as you are touching a reference, a chair, a wall, just leaning slightly into it, it means that you, you know, your brain will require less effort I say less cognitive resources to be able to keep your posture upright and your balance as well, because these two are, are related. So that you can be more free to think and to talk better. These are, are small tricks that we usually refer to people. Um, and I think it's important for your friends and family to know this so that when they do, you know, uh, meet you, they don't have conversations of half an hour in the standing position. That would be an example. If on the other uh, side, we also have someone that is actually suffering from fatigue. So this would be, imagine someone that is sleepy throughout the day, that sits down on the couch and has a sleep attack. If I want to have a conversation with that person and I would say be kind to that person, kind knowing that he suffers from that by sitting in a nice comfortable couch, I know the person will be struggling more to keep attentive. So maybe I can break down the conversation by standing up and, and talking a bit and then sitting down again and then standing up. And I know it might sound a little ridiculous, but you know, you do get exercise out of it, <laughs> but it, it actually helps the person to maintain the, the alertness better. 
so that the communication can go better. So these are just indirect things that will influence uh, also the communication. Yeah. They've said that there. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting by reducing the load, uh, you're you're improving it. And you're not saying necessarily they have to be sit, sitting down. Mm -hmm. You could have just something where you put a little leaning or put your hand on there for stability, right? If you're a couple, you just hold on to the partner. I mean, they have to serve for something. Oh, yes, yeah, good. <laughs> yes. That's something to look forward to. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. And I, I was going to highlight that. For any uh, problem that the person with Parkinson might go through, like these, you know, depression, apathy, uh, the way that we can find uh, tips and tricks to be able to help ourselves, I'll say someone with Parkinson, is to really have the right rationale was that if you think about, the doctor will obviously adjust the medication when it has to be adjusted. If all the professionals always say, you know, contact your doctor, but there's what more can you do is this. Try to study what makes the symptoms worse and what makes them better. Because whatever triggers the fatigue, the sleep, the balance will probably be your guide. And whatever alleviates it is, is even more strong because it's actually your guide to uh, controlling it and managing it better. So this was just an example of in case of sleepiness and fatigue affecting communication, what can I do about it? Let me just try to understand how can I reduce the sleepiness? Like I was giving you the strategy of maybe raising the alertness by standing up or identifying that it's maybe it's the sleep issues that are causing this. How do I alleviate? How can I drink in coffee? So there's, there's certain, there's a lot of non-pharmacological strategies that people can do to handle these non-motor issues. And that's the key message here. Very good. Yeah, I think it's, Regardless of what the cause is, and being a bit of a scientist about it and understanding what is leading to it and maybe what is providing some benefit will help you when you're talking with your doctor about what the solution would be, you know, especially if you're going to go beyond um, the, the basics of improving your sleep quality or something like that. Um, okay, so before I go on here, I want to make sure that I'm not going too quickly through this. We're going to talk about how we treat it. We talked a little bit of some of the factors involved, the actual factors involved with why there might be communication issues and it goes beyond just speech production voice production and into some of the physical components does anyone have any kind of questions you can put your hand up too even if you want to before i everyone, go into interventions everyone doing good everyone yes. okay we can have a code yeah oh, no, <laughs> yeah go, go for it here someone raise the hand um you want to unmute yourself there you go i just wondered if you studied why dbs tends to bring on speech problems and is it electrical in nature? And are there certain settings that can help alleviate speech problems with DBS? Okay, uh, well, that's a very good question, Donna. And I, I'm, I actually have some slides that I might I might skip ahead so you can see that. Uh, I put them near the end. I didn't have them in the here, but I kept them for reference. I, I would say that... Um, yeah, okay, I'll, maybe at the end, I'll bring these up here. Um, historically, deep brain stimulation or DBS just for people where you put electrodes into the brain and they provide a stimulation that that provides some relief. And that's kind of what we're dealing with. In the back, in the past, uh, you, you, you would do this with a particular set of electrodes and you would do it either in a part of the brain called the subthalamic nucleus, which is pretty close to the, the um, part of the brain stem that has the cranial nerves that uh, innervate the face. And that's kind of where I think it ties into speech a little bit. Um, so generally speaking, they put the electrode right in the subthalamic nucleus, and right below that is the beginning of what we call the descending cortical bulb or fibers that make, you know, animate your, your lips and your teeth and your voice through the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And so that's why that can be a problem. I would say that it, it, there's been some pretty significant advancements over time um, in that uh, now they're using what we call current steering, where you can actually divide the electrode into thirds or, or even greater sections and newer versions have that. And so you, instead of having the current go all directions, you can actually have it go towards one side and not towards the other. And so that makes it very program dependent. And that, that's something that you'll need to make sure that you're working closely with the doctor or whoever's doing the programming. But uh, both the uh, uh, Boston Scientific and uh, the one uh, that used to be St. Jude, but I think got bought by another company um, by Abbott, I believe. Those both have current steering. That's one innovation. And then another one is the use of this closed loop system that Medtronic has, where the 
electrode is providing stimulation, but it's also acting as a receptor and understanding when there's uh, brain waves that may, that are indicating it needs to turn up its its uh, its uh, current, and so that dynamic changing uh, it also means that you get more current when you need it and less current when you don't, and it can it can identify and improve that. I would say if you're really concerned about speech issues, I have a feeling that the current steering is going to be a closer solution, but they're both making gains. Um, there is another target uh, for deep brain stimulation called GPI, the globus pallidus pars interna. It's a larger target. It's a little farther outside. And it, it's not close to those craniofacial nerves. So sometimes it might provide a different target, although there is some potential for stimulation of uh, like internal capsule and stuff like that. But um, but uh, the only thing with GPI is that it does do different things and the, the doctor would make a decision with you. Like you don't typically reduce your medications as much on GPI versus STN, which is why I think STN happens more often. Does that give you enough information? Do you have a specific question, Donna? Well, if you have it in the STN, does that affect your voice more than ha Yeah, most people that I know have it in STN, unless they're doing something for tremor, but. Yep, I agree. But, um, Medtronics doesn't have the closed loop yet, as far as I know, but they both have directional currents. But if you happen to have DBS from like say 10, maybe even five years ago, and you don't have that, is there anything that they could do with the settings to help the speech? You know, if you don't have direct, you wanna keep it away from certain areas, I guess, the stimulation, or you wanna vary it based on. Yep. Well, okay, the brain, brain, yeah, the brain resistance. You've hit two different areas and, and both are good solutions. You can program it uh, uh, very carefully to maximize the benefit. And again, the older ones, the old Medtronic has four leads where the new, the new Boston Scientific has eight. And that gives you a little more granularity. Um, but if you have an older system, you would have to probably be pretty careful about how you're gonna program it. And, and if you're not, again, this is doctor stuff. I don't wanna get too deep in the world. I did take a programming class, but I don't do it myself. And I think that you would want to uh, be real, real um, granular with the doctor about what your needs are. And that gets to my second part of that question, which is sometimes people might have a setting that's more for walking around and, and, and being more physically active and one for maybe when they're seated and it's like a communication program and you, you'll get a, a, the ability to make a change. Typically, you're not going to make major changes, but you can have like a preset setting for communication and a preset setting for, for ambulation or something like that. Um, you said something very interesting. Can you take a programming class? Um, I, I'm not sure that uh, um, the the ability to do real granular programming, you cannot, uh, as a patient or as a person living with Parkinson's, do it yourself. Your doctor will, will need to be involved or your program will be involved. But there are some uh, consumer education programs from all the different manufacturers. If you go to the manufacturer for your device or you talk to your rep in your area, they might be able to point you to some educational content. It's interesting. I do a I do a program uh, a, a bunch of I'm a tech nerd and I have a bunch of friends with Parkinson's who are tech nerds and one of them down in Australia actually had the Boston Scientific. He has a background as a PhD in physics, so he's got a little bit of math down there and he is actually very involved with it, but uh, still has to do it all through the doctor. But he he just published a paper about it about maybe a month ago. If anybody wants that, I can send it to Casey and he talks about advocacy for getting the right programming. For himself, I'd be very interested in that. I'm an electrical engineer, and my sister has Parkinson's as a doctor. Yeah, okay, and, yeah. You know, DBS is all open loop, and it would be great if the person can actually do the programming if they're technically involved because it's open loop right now until Medtronics gets the closed loop system. But I, I would be I, really I, interested in that paper and finding out yeah, more. About yeah, thank well, you very much. I'll, I'll find it. He's got, he's got two of them, but the most recent one is about that. And um, I'll come back to that a little bit, okay? So um, good, good questions though, interesting, interesting area. Um, DBS is changing so fast that sometimes it's, it's even hard to keep up. When they did the current steering, it was like, that's when I was like, oh, this is getting a lot more, like I do need to have a PhD in electric or uh, MSEE. I need to be an electrical engineer to be able to make it work because it's pretty complicated. The other question I had that no one answers in the DBS field, you know, Medtronic started up voltage controlled, constant mm -hmm. voltage control. Okay. And that kind of takes it. So the current varies 
based on your brain resistance, I yes. would say, because voltage equals current times resistance. But all the manufacturers have gone to resistance, I mean, constant current control. So I don't know how they're adjusting the current for the brain resistance, but that's, and I, I don't know if that's affecting the speech that much either, but I do notice that a lot of people get speech problems when they get DBS back they, in the old days. <laughs> yeah, definitely with the older systems, I would say that often those, those changes resolve. And I do think it's a good reason to do some speech therapy to kind of build up on it. Um, but I think, again, you're getting a little bit above my pay grade. I, I go back to the doctor on this. I'll send you the article for sure. Okay? okay, thanks. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Okay, moving along to uh, treatments and interventions. Um, the, the, the way that we address Parkinson's in general uh, is gonna start with medications and or surgery, but medications. And uh, with respect to speech, Medications will do some of the same things it would do for your movement. So when you take your, your Cinemet or you take your dopamine agonist, um, your movement becomes a little easier, a little faster. Uh, uh, and uh, that is exactly what you would expect from those medications. And those parts of, of, of speech will also improve. You might, you might be a little bit louder, which would be great as a speech therapist, that'd be fantastic. But I think what we find in the research is that the medications don't actually improve intelligibility. So while certain movement related parts of speech, how fast it's going, maybe with the amount of force that's being used, uh, the timing, those are benef benefited, but it doesn't always seem to improve intelligibility. And so uh, some people do report feeling a little bit more on and having better, better speech when it's on, and that's great. But I'd say in general, you're gonna to need to augment that a little bit and you're gonna augment that with a speech language pathologist with a, with a non-pharmacological, non-medication speech therapy interventions. And the, the ones that I think most people are familiar with uh, would be LSVT loud. And LSVT uh, is the original program for high intensity, high volume. And then uh, Speak Out came out a little bit later on, and they're a growing program that has quite a bit of, uh, of practitioners now. And there's some other approaches that I'm going to talk about, because sometimes it's not always about volume. Again, LSVT came out first. It happened in the, maybe the mid-80s, and it's a high-intensity, high-amplitude protocol, meaning that your practitioner is supposed to do it the same way every time, four times a week for a month, um, and that seems to get the benefits. It's got a lot of research. It's got four lines of NIH funding, a lot of what we call level one evidence, meaning it's double-blinded, which is very difficult to do in our field because you essentially have to find a clinician that doesn't know your protocol, teach them a fake protocol, have them do it because neither the person getting the treatment nor the person administering the treatment could know who's getting the active arm. So it's much easier in a pharmacological setting, difficult for rehab. And they have recently integrated a, what's called Loud for Life, which is like a carryover group. So it's kind of a nice approach. And again, they have probably, probably maybe they're up to 100 articles by now. They have dozens and dozens of articles out. Um, Speak Out is a program that came out maybe in the late 90s, early 2000s. And one thing I like about their approach is that they have a hard copy book and they have a lot of grant funding. It's a, it's a nonprofit. They have a pay it forward system. And so anytime someone comes on your caseload, you reach out to the folks in Texas you say, I have this person, they're on my caseload, they ship the book to the, the patient. And then that is a workbook that they can work through. And I find that much easier to deal with. Uh, there's no questions about what the homework assignment is. You just go to the next page and it's easy to follow along with. Um, they also have uh, a group called uh, uh, the Loud Crowd. And the Loud Crowd was actually, uh, I think it was their innovation and it's a like, carryover group. They continue to do it even now uh, online. And I, I think it's a nice program. Um, one thing that's interesting about Speak Out is that they've been getting a lot of grants out to university programs and practitioners, and you might find someone in your neighborhood uh, in, in Pittsburgh, Casey can probably help you find them, that got one of these grants and their programs are, are all subsidized by the, the nonprofit. So it's a, great, it's a great approach. They don't have quite the amount of research. I think they have seven or eight articles, but they're growing. Um, when you move beyond those two programs, which are, I won't say they're interchangeable, but they're very similar. There's also a program in the Netherlands called Pitch Limiting Voice Therapy, which I would say is fairly similar to. Um, then you get into exercise that maybe is focused on improving kind of the quality of the speech with like resonant voice, or you're strengthening the underlying musculature with a vocal function, and then technologies that might come into play. And we'll, we'll talk about speech divide in a moment. I also think it's really important 
to mention again intonation and prosody and intonation is the pitches and ups and downs i think that's always worth training and again it doesn't really happen in the other approaches you can you can add it in obviously um, but it's a way to get around that oh good someone's saying that penn west um okay oh, penn state both have speech clinics and speak out yeah so those are two university clinics that uh, Casey's mentioning now, uh, Penn West University, formerly California University of Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania State University, both have speak out programs. Again, um, uh, in addition to being a great clinician, Samantha Landry, the founder of Speak Out is a brilliant fundraiser and she has managed to raise for her nonprofit millions and millions of dollars so they can underwrite that. She's done an amazing job for that. Um, there's other things you could be focusing on, such as uh, fluency issues, stuttering problems, and that might be another thing that uh, we might address, and there's ways to get around it. Another thing that's interesting is a expiratory muscle strength training. It's a breath device. It's got great research. It's out of the University of Florida, and sometimes that's a nice approach for a number of reasons. The initial research came out on improving swallowing, but now there's a body of research showing that it also improves communication, but for a different reason. I only mentioned this speech five device because it, it's uh, it's something that is in my armamentarium. I use it every now and then when I have someone who's not getting all the benefits or they can't keep the benefits up. And basically, it's a wearable that fits over your ear a little bit like a hearing aid or now all, all the kids are wearing AirPods. It's kind of like that. And what it does is it senses whenever you're talking, it has an accelerometer there. And when it understands that you are speaking, it puts loud sound into your ear and it induces a reflex called the Lombard effect. That's a, a reflex, so you can't stop it you know, any more than you could stop you know, blinking. And it makes you talk louder automatically. And um, what's kind of cool about this is that we've known about this effect for a long time, but in the past when you would use this, we would use like a noise, like a, sh like a white noise sound, and then people would adapt and it wouldn't work. The innovation uh, by this research with Dr. Huber, Jessica Huber, is that um, they made it with multi-speaker babble. And that means people are talking in the background. And because we're human beings, we can't resist. We have to keep listening. Like, are they talking about me? I think I just heard my name. And, and for some reason, there's no adaptation effect. Um, they got FDA approval a while back, and it's actually available through insurance. So I, I watched them as a startup going through leaving Purdue University technology transfer. They've done a very good job. So it's avail available. Don, do you have another hand up? What can I do for you? Yeah, I just wondered if you uh, have any experience with the vibrating finger gloves by um, out of Stanford or with pulse electromagnetic fields affecting speech when you wear those devices. Uh, yes, Peter Tass at Stanford actually reviewed one of his grants a couple of years ago. Um, I'm very familiar with it. It's called Focus Viral Tactile Reset. That study that you saw in the Today Show was only an N of seven, and it was, that's a pretty small study, so that's a phase one. Um, that had some interesting research. Uh, we'll have to see what happens with the next set of studies, which are ongoing right now, and they're going to be um, real randomized controlled trials, so there'll be a better source of data. But there's actually a startup out of the UK called Charco Neurotech that's doing something very similar and getting very similar results. And so I like it when two different laboratories are getting similar results. Uh, they wear theirs on the sternum. That's kind of a, kind of a cool placement place. Uh, the, the gloves, you wear them on your hands, and then yeah, obviously you can't do stuff while you're wearing them, but then it has carryover effects. So I like the idea of a sternum, but I, I don't have a, I don't, I'm not have a, a horse in that race. So whoever gets there faster and, and gives you benefits and can prove it with real data, I'm, I'm on board for either one. This thing with the helmet, that's a, a photobiomodulation. They just published a study a couple of weeks ago that my friend, the the, the um, physicist, was just breaking down, and I need to see a lot more research. That it seems there's a test out there called the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. They were using parts of that test, and they were breaking it out, which you don't do. And so that makes me go, why would you do that? And so I, again, I want to see more. I'm not saying no, but uh, Dr. Tass is much further along with what they're doing. Lucy Young with Sharko Neurotech is much farther along. I'll have to see what's going on with this helmet. Fair as enough? Part, as part of the universal uh, Parkinson's test, do they also do a speech rating as part of that test? In, in the in the section two, it's a kind of a survey. So three is the motor where you actually do mm -hmm. the things. Uh, Josefa will do that sometimes when someone's doing. The question is, have you noticed changes in your voice? So it's 
and then you quantify it, you rate it. Oh, so there is, it takes, it, it takes a Ducat speech. Okay, thanks. It, it's like a very broad test of, of it, though. I would do a different one. Yes, and then Richard, what do you have? Yeah, um, I have a problem uh, with gunk in my throat. Um, it comes about 11 o'clock every morning. Uh, it's thick, sticky stuff. It, uh, it, it, it significantly inter interferes with my, with my speaking. Uh, worse off, the clearing of that, uh, <clears throat> all that kind of stuff is really damaging my vocal cords now. And have you run across that through among your patients? And I do have a, uh, a, a meeting with an ENT uh, in a couple of weeks to, to give me a thorough study of that. But, uh, I, and I'm working with a speech therapist now who uh, describes my, my speech as very airy. You don't, maybe you don't hear it so much right here now, but anyway, uh, it's a real bother. And, uh, I, you know, I avoid meetings, I avoid uh, phone calls and stuff like that in the middle of the day. And it's really tragic. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> well, let me, let me give you a couple of thoughts for Richard. I mean, the, the fact that it happens at the same time every day, that has my attention. I mean, that's going back to being a little bit of a scientist of understanding triggers and timings. Is it timed with a medication dose or maybe a medication dose wearing off? Is it timed with food that you're eating at a certain time? Or maybe it's fine when your food is running out, which is where I'm heading with this. Your ENT will know this better. They'll, they'll be able to see it. But mm -hmm. I wonder sometimes, I, I encounter people that have a little bit of reflux. Reflux is very common in, in Parkinson's. Instead mm -hmm. of 8% of the population, it's close to 24. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes when that reflux is starting to happen, maybe when you haven't eaten for a while and your, your acid's building up, it tends to refer up and cause irritation. Uh, it doesn't affect, it doesn't explain the, the mucus as per se, but it does uh, sometimes cause kind of a problem that uh, may seem like it's up here when it's actually manifesting from your stomach. So yeah, a, I, I, yeah. I, I do think it's coming from below somewhere. But, uh, oh, the other thing is I sleep on my back because of a back condition all night uh, mm -hmm. and get pretty dry mouth and stuff like that. So yeah. uh, I, I've got, I, I'm, I, I'm chasing a solution here, but uh, uh, thanks for your thoughts on it. That ENT is going to be a very, very illuminating session because they'll be able to, if, you're, if your speech therapist thinks that your vocal folds aren't, if they're airy, you probably yeah. have bowed vocal folds, which is very common in, in Parkinson's, and that ENT will be able to see it. They're going to put a little camera in there, and they'll be able to see it very quickly. And they'll also see any indications of reflux. And, th and th the good thing about reflux is that there's probably some medication approaches that will benefit that, although you could also raise the head of your bed a little bit, especially if you're a back sleeper. And I, I, I like to do too. Uh, Joseph will catch me every time. Um, but often I'll, I'll use a pill or something to keep me from keeping my mouth open because I like to sleep on my back too. And it's not, it's mm. not the best way to do it. But if your back is, if you have an injury, you're, you're doing it. So you have to find a solution. That'd be a good one to ask your ENT about like, Hey, I'm medically restricted to sleeping in this position. How do I optimize that? There could be a wedge pillow. There could be raising the head of your bed with a brick or two. That's a very common way to do that. But get your ENT's advice on that part. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, good. I, I will say last thing, the ENT might might already be on top of this. The medications to dry out those secretions, I don't think they're going to be that great. They're going to dry out your vocal folds too, but let them be doctors to doctors to deciders. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. I won't go any further. Speech Vibe is available if you need it. Um, uh, a lot of clinics already have them on site that you can test, but uh, I'll, I'll go on from there. But I want to get to tips and strategies. Um, one thing I think that's really important is that um, when you're dealing with communication problems, definitely you want to work with a speech therapist. You want to get stronger. You want to get better benefits from the from the, the talking louder begets talking louder. So if you use your voice, it's a user to lose it. So more more utilization is great. But you also want to be uh, savvy about how you're picking communication environments. And so if you're going to go out to a restaurant. Uh, you might patronize ones that don't quite have such noise, noisy environments or don't put you in tables that are really close to each other. I, I personally find restaurants that have a, to pay attention to putting uh, dampening panels on the wall. Those are places that I like to go to because they, they're paying attention. They understand 
that having everyone compete for making them a sound is really hard on everybody. Why is it hard? It's not just because it makes you strain and makes you work harder than you need to, but because you got to spend that extra effort to be loud enough, that takes cognition, that takes attention, that takes energy. And so now instead of focusing on being with your friends and your family and enjoying your time, now I have to be sure I get in and I'm heard and that's a pain. No one wants to deal with that. Alongside auditory noise, which we're all aware of, visual noise can also be its own issue. And I find that if people to tell me that they're taking too long at a mealtime, the first thing I do is say, can we get to an environment where whoever you're talking with is facing you and behind them is the wall? So people aren't walking behind there and you're not getting all these noises. It's not just auditory noise, it's visual noise. And then once you get past those situations and you've optimized that as much as possible, then I would start looking at maybe with some of the tech and I'll, I'll show you a little speaker idea that you can use. And then the thing that, that uh, Josefa was alluding to earlier on is um, vision and hearing loss are common in all of us. As we all get older, it's going to be something that occurs and it could be something you can correct with glasses. It could be something that you can correct with a cataract surgery or even a LASIK kind of surgery. And I would say for the person with Parkinson's as well as their care partner, it's worth getting a screening and seeing if there's any solutions because um, you know, if you have a problem with your voice related to Parkinson's, you can do therapy and you can get stronger and you'll make it happen and you'll get some benefit from it. But if you can go to your doctor and get a prescription for eyeglasses, that's an immediate fix that is almost no effort. It's just wear your eyeglasses. And, and now hearing aids are available over the counter, although I do think a good audiologist can really help you dial in on your specific needs. And so I'm, I'm not sure how I feel about that, but there are more options than there ever were before. Did you, did you have something you want to have? You know, make sure. This is also going to happen in other environments. So in workplace settings, uh, again, if you are, are still in the job environment, these kind of big group areas where there's lots of people talking, I'd be trying to find the way to the wall. I'd be trying to find ways to make sure that I have enough lighting so that people are able to see me and I'm able to see them if I'm talking with them. And then if you're going to use technologies in these environments, I think uh, it's a great setting to do this. I, I'm, I'm a big advocate of speech recognition software. Um, so before, when I was mentioning, uh, if you're going to a noisy restaurant, um, I, I think everyone should consider having one of these little portable voice amplifiers. They used to be very expensive. They used to be something when you cost $120, $150, or buy them through a Salmon's Preston catalog. It could be hundreds of dollars, but I, I see them all over the place now on Amazon. They're about the size of a, of a family-sized box of raisins. They're battery powered and the battery lasts like 20 hours and rechargeable, you know, it's a, it was a lithium ion battery. And typically speaking, it's just a little amplification uh, speaker. You can put it somewhere convenient that's not too obvious. And you can, instead of wearing a headset microphone, which I, I do sometimes, you can actually get a lapel one and just clip it here, or even just put it up to your mouth when you wanna speak. And actually, you might find that at your table, there's a couple other people who might want to use it as well. And so you might have more than one. And that actually even, I say, I don't call it stigma, but de decreases how, how obvious it is. I, I find this to be the easiest quick fix. And I see dozens of them on Amazon for under $40. So it's worth checking out. And the only thing I, I would say uh, is that I've seen a number of models that have a wireless mic. And that seems like a great idea. And I have been burned over and over again. Someone will make a wireless mic that doesn't break down in like six weeks. Until then, I don't recommend them. So I would get a wired one. Uh, because we're still doing so much on Zoom as we are tonight, I, I also like to tell people maybe getting a, a pair of headphones with a, an adjustable microphone, uh, like the kids do for gaming. Uh, that's a very nice solution. A, you'll get better uh, quality because you'll be able to hear it easier because it's over your ears. And then you can direct that microphone instead of having to talk into a microphone that's up here that's on your computer, you can just move it right into place and that's very valuable. Um, and then when you're on the phone, if you're going to use the phone, um, the first tip is that most of the microphones for your phone are in the bottom. So you talk like this and you're going to get much better speech. You can use uh, earbuds like wired earbuds. The Bluetooth headsets, including the AirPods, and I, I love my AirPods but the microphone is way back here in the earpiece. And sometimes those have a harder time giving you good 
good quality speech signal. I notice that when I dictate how much worse the dictation quality is when I take it out and I dictate onto my phone um, that it seems to be much better. So Bluetooth, your mileage may vary. If you're on uh, the computer a lot, just an external microphone itself can be very valuable. This is one that sits on your desk. I put the, the actual names of them and where you can get them all on Amazon. Each one of these is probably 50 to $60. So they're not cheap, but they're not prohibitive. And again, you can move that microphone up to your, your, um, your, your voice. You can, you can talk right into it if you need to get better sound quality. So it's a nice way to improve it. A lot of times on laptops, they have very tiny microphones and they're shaped in a certain way so that if you get too far away from the laptop, the, the quality degrades. It's, it's, it's intentional to give you a better experience, but it can be harder to be understood on those kind of microphones. And then finally, I really like, um, I really am a big fan of speech recognition software. Um, back in uh, many years ago, I did a lot of my work and including my research on speech recognition. But I think as a speech therapist, it not only is it an opportunity to make it easier to get around on your phone or your computer, or if you have a smart speaker like an Amazon, I'm not gonna say it because I don't wanna turn it on or a Google Home, um, one of those things, it's a very nice way uh, to use your voice every day. And then there's a lot of things you can do to improve uh, your workflow. So instead of having to type, you can dictate a document. Um, pretty much Mac and PC, Microsoft, uh, or the Office Suite, all have free versions of those software. So you don't have to buy one. If you're working in a work environment, I do kind of recommend buying the Dragon because it's a little bit better. And with a decent microphone, you can dictate text, uh, emails, documents. I, I, I do most of my writing still with speech recognition, even though I don't have to anymore. On a phone, you can actually call up apps and programs. So instead of having to hunt through and find your maps program, you can just say, hey, Siri, open Google Maps, and it'll pop up there, and it'll be showing you what you're doing. I have, her, I have it in do not disturb mode, so she didn't bother me. Another quick, simple one would be, again, on your phone, you can send a, a, a text or add a calendar thing that I'd say like, hey, Siri, uh, schedule an appointment with Casey at Parkinson's Foundation of Western Pennsylvania on Saturday the 30th at 5 a.m. Boom, it would do that 5 a.m. Uh, Eastern time, 10 a.m. over here or something like that. So it's like, it's easy enough to do that. It's a good way to practice it. And and I would just recommend if you haven't done any exploring with that, it's 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 available everywhere now. It's available on every device and there are free versions everywhere. So it's worth checking out. Just because it's such a common, oh yeah, Xfinity has voice controlled, yes, uh, TV. You know, my first startup with one of my professors at the University of Colorado, this is right when HDMI came out in 2007, we were trying to make a voice controlled television. We couldn't figure out the microphone, but uh, now it's everywhere. Um, Word finding issues are so common in Parkinson's. This tip of the tongue issue, this is something that I think uh, we wanna give you a couple of strategies for. It's something ask, people ask us about every single time. One thing I'll say, Donna, is there's a little bit of research that uh, says DBS may influence word finding. Just, uh, it's the only area it does. There's no other real cognitive effects of DBS, but word finding or verbal fluency may have an influence on there. When you come across this problem, the first thing I would try to do is try to work my way around it. The, the technical term is circumlocution, but I'm just going to say, uh, you know, I was getting onto the, you know, the, the public transport. And I'm, saying there's, I'm either saying subway or bus, but it doesn't really matter because I've gotten around it. You know what I'm talking about. And we're now on to the next topic. So that's valuable. Um, if you're in a conversation with people that you know and trust, you can crowdsource like, hey, you know, what is it? Uh, it starts with you know what I'm talking about, and hopefully your spouse will be able to give you some assistance or your care partner or your friend. Um, particularly if it's your care partner, you might have a conversation about how much help you want, because sometimes you want that help and sometimes you don't. But when you're in the moment, you can just crowdsource and see, see if someone can help you. And then finally, you can, uh, if it's not that important, you can say, ah, it'll come back to me in a couple of minutes and leave a placeholder. And I think that's my most common experience is that the words missing here about seven minutes later while we're in another part of the conversation is like, oh yeah, you know, it's a rumple stillskin, you know, and it comes back. 
So don't be afraid to, to try to manage it and not suffer from it because it's very common. And then we like to have these tips at the end here where we talk a little bit about how to, how to get your best uh, communication. So if you're the person with Parkinson's, um, especially if you're dealing with quiet speech, make sure whoever you're talking to, you have their attention, you get the eye contact. You wanna make sure that they're listening to you so that you can um, start off. They're not gonna miss the first couple of words. Um, I, upright posture as much as possible. Full breath of air is very important. And then uh, try to keep it steady. So don't, don't uh, stop and start if you can avoid that. I think it's really helpful to be confident and own your space and use gestures and take your time. And if someone's trying to interrupt you, give you a little, hey, I'm still talking here. You need to be, you need to feel confident you have that. This is your opportunity to communicate. And just because maybe things have, have uh, changed a bit, you, that's still your place and you get to own it. And that's a good thing to work on with the speech therapist is improving all the mechanics of it, but also improving some of the uh, taking taking control, uh, advocacy for yourself. And um, that's really important, I think. I think people sometimes try to think, well, I want to get this in because, I, you know, I don't, it's like, yeah, you walk in and you take as much time as you need to get what you need to say out. Mm -hmm. For a care partner, reduce your background noise. Well, I remember talking about the also the background visual noise. Uh, backlighting, if you're facing a window and you're, 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 your person you're talking to is backlit like that, that can be really hard to, to see. So try to get the, everyone in a situation where no one's got a bunch of light coming out from behind them. If there's something that's breaking down, don't worry about reiterating the entire sentence. Just clarify the misunderstood part of that. You know, and if you get really stuck or things are going, is getting harder and harder, break it down to a simple yes, no. Did you want to do this? You want to go here? want to do it's like you can you can make it easier i think sometimes people want to get a big head of steam and start with the well what we were saying blah, 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 blah. it's like no just just excise the part that was broken and fix that so yeah yeah it's just i i think one of the the ways that we can uh, increase our communication skills is really to see throughout the day where can i in you know, use it more. Where can I use my voice more? And John gave a good example about the the new electronic tools, but I think we can we can think more about as we go out, as we meet people. Um, really, it at at the end of the day, the communication will be much more right if we are more aware of it when throughout the day. And then we we had also focusing on the the things that influence. Uh, your communication as well. And namely, cognition is a strong one, right? So this finding the words or even the capacity to stay attentive in a conversation, follow a conversation. Um, it, I think people should be made aware that if I can improve my cognitive skills, I will probably influence my communication skills as well. So there is um, these exercises for both. So there's for exercises for voice, but there's also exercises for cognition. And now we know that even integrating those two in mimics, I would say, daily life. So I'm talking with someone, so I have to be attentive to all these variables, what I listen to when I, and what I talk to as well. I think, I mean, and this gets into kind of the work that we like to do with the exercise that has movement and voice together like that. I think that's where we notice this. And I think it's valuable to incorporate voice into whatever exercise you're doing, in mm -hmm. addition to doing specific voice exercise. Yeah. So it goes in line with our that thought of you know what what can I do in terms of um, to control not only Parkinson progression or if we think about the symptoms, but specifically here in terms of communication, we know that the influence directly with cognition. So exercise and diet, and you know and sleep as well are three key elements that we hear about how much they influence quality of life and in this case alertness, cognition, communication as well. So it's always valid. You, you know, you hit on something there too. I think if if anybody hasn't taken a look at how they can improve their sleep quality, um, it to me it's one of these things where I think we all get into certain habits and we forget about them. But a perfect example is I stopped bringing my phone back into the bedroom at all when I'm trying to go to bed. It goes out there and I just read something print, and that made an immediate influence on my sleep quality. And uh, it's like just, it's still a little odd. If you haven't thought about it lately figure out bad habits that you're doing. Maybe you're watching uh, the news too late at night or you're watching an action movie or something that's got too much agitation. 
figure out what you can do to fix it, and then have a conversation with your doctor to see if there are other things you might be able to do something with medications that can improve that as well. But um, sleep is a big one, in addition to the diet and, and mm -hmm. exercise. So Donna has a suggestion here Yeah, that she recommends Brain HQ app. Mm -hmm. Brain HQ, what I like about that, a, a perfect example, a lot of times I'll pull that app out and I'll do it with my voice. I mean, I'll do the movement and I'll say it out loud, but it has a lot of basic concepts and colors in there. So you can just narrating, narrating the app is a really great way to do that. So it's... Um, that was the Adam Gonzalez project that they actually have more research than some of the other ones out there. It's a nice group out in San Francisco at USC. Just key messages real quick. We're closing it up here. All of you need to get to a local speech therapist, somebody that's in the area. Um, Casey over at Parkinson's Foundation or Western Pennsylvania knows all the people there. Develop a long-term relationship with them and keep working with them. You're going to need their help over time. Augment with technology when you need to and apply some of the strategies we're talking about. Definitely address any hearing or vision changes. That's really important. And be real, uh, real cognizant of your settings so that you get the best communication environment so you can take the skills you learn with your SLP and bring them to bear in a good way rather than having to fight your way through a noisy restaurant. And then any other symptoms that you can be addressing to affect communication, like we're talking about the depression and the sleep mm -hmm. issues. That's kind of my takeaways here, I believe. Mm -hmm. The slides will be available. Oh, yeah. Someone's asking the slides. Yeah, the slides will be available along with the recording. I'm sure Casey will put it on their YouTube channel, right? Good. Can we answer any questions? I see another hand up there. Yeah, I'll, I'll stop sharing here. We're good? Mm -hmm. I just had a question, John, about another research topic. And, and Richard's question kind of brought this up because they're doing a study of Ambroxyl. That's yes. based on mucinex, which is used to get phlegm out. Yep. And that's going to get the alpha folded alpha synuclein out of the brain. And I just wondered, are you following that study that's entering phase two trials? Yeah. So what's interesting about Ambroxyl, yeah, it's anti uh it's it, it is working on the mucus. That's from a group in the UK called the Cure Parkinson's Trust. And we love those people. They're really very smart because what they're doing is they're doing a repositioning study. So Ambroxyl is available on the market for completely different use. And uh, they've managed to identify it to address something. Now with medications, if you're gonna be talking about misfolded alpha-synuclein, uh, which is a uh, protein in the brain, it's gotta get past the blood brain barrier to do that. So finding something that does that is one thing, but finding something that does that, that actually gets to the part of the brain where it's necessary is interesting. So that's a very promising study. Uh, it, because it's already uh, FDA approved and over the counter for, for that matter, um, that means they don't have to do any of the safety studies that they would do before for some of the other stuff. And that's what's interesting. Repositioning of medications is a very smart approach. Cure Parkinson's Trust is not a huge nonprofit, but I really think they punch way above their weight class because they're very smartly using research and machine learning to identify those targets and then bring them to market. There was another study a couple of years ago with, with a tricyclic antidepressant, nortriptyline, and that was also showing some benefits. And um, it's not a commonly used one now. There are better ones out there, but they've noticed some benefits for Parkinson's. So the Cure Parkinson's Trust, uh, uh, A, Tom Isaacs was just a brilliant, he's a brilliant dude. We both miss him a lot. But that's a really smart uh, uh, nonprofit that's doing a, a good use of the resources they have that way. Yeah, and Broxel isn't sold here but in the inhaled Ambroxyl isn't sold here in the United States, only in Europe. I'm sure that's something they'll be able to work out if they manage to find a good use case for it. I think it has a safety record is what the issue is. I mean, I think that's why that's why it's interesting. You know, if you take a brand new substance from from lab to to, you know, being able to sold at your pharmacy, that's a big long haul. If you can cut out a big part of that by getting something that's already available. Uh, uh, phenobutyrate was another one that was being studied at the University of Colorado, Kurt Freed, the guy that did the, the, the stem cells in the early 2000s. And the whole benefit with that is like, hey, it's already out there. Uh, pharmaceuticals like it because it's it's something where they can just repackage it and then be able to sell it on a new patent. But for us, it just means it gets to market faster. Very cool, very good, very good comment. Uh, I think, I think uh, you keep up to date on stuff, don't you, Donna? I'm going to find a cure for Parkinson's. My name is Donna Herbert, and I'm going to find a cure. <laughs> hey, hey, you're out to God's ears. We're here for it. Okay. Wonderful. Any other questions? 
Thank you both, Josefa and John. It was really educational and also provided us with some really practical tools. Yes, clap, yay. Well, thank you. Please. Oh, you're welcome. Well, go ahead. No, I was just saying thank you for having us. We always love talking oh, with you, talking with your people. And um, yeah, please follow up with any questions. Yeah, see you soon. Hit the next one. Definitely. And um, August 1st, you'll be presenting on tips to improve gait. And then on November 7th, the duo will be presenting again on setting healthy goals and choices in Parkinson. So we'll see you all before that, I'm sure. Um, but save those dates and um, see you all soon. Thanks again. Thanks. Thank you all. Bye-bye. <laughs>